Dr. Mike McCoy here. Um, As you saw from my title, I'm going to talk today about how to teach your students or how I teach my students to learn music. I usually give this lecture once a semester to the new students that come into my studio that have, it can either be pre-college or the university, that have some problems about how they determine to learn music. So I'm just going to tell you how I do it, which is mostly plagiarized from Irene Peary uh, because I studied with her when I was very little and she had a system and this is how you did it. And I, uh, in my pedagogy, in my old age, I have uh, decided, I should get some laughs from that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I have discovered that I don't believe that for sure there is only one right way to do basically anything, right? Especially not how your students are going to learn music. But I will tell you this. The biggest problem that I see with students who come to my studio is that they don't have a plan. How, what is the plan about how you're going to learn your pieces? So I'm going to just show you, I want to be very specific about what I'm talking about. I think that all students need to be trained in technique. Not all teachers do this separately. Some very famous and successful teachers don't do this separately. They believe technique is supposed to be taught in the music. I grew up doing scales, arpeggios, chords, 15 minutes of my hour lesson every single week. And I believe that it's good for students to learn the mechanics of movement. I also think being polyphonic instrument specialists, we have to give our students opportunities to become good readers, right? So this is specific exercises geared towards sight reading and helping students develop a lot of those skills that sometimes are looked over in the lesson. What I'm actually talking about today is my third category. And that is, I'd like to assign this student a piece that at, w at some point in time, they will have to perform from memory. So how do you, how do you give a student a piece and say, learn this, right? Well, I've seen a lot of times Students have no idea really how to do that, right? What are some of your experiences? I'm not talking to, usually, usually what I do is, is when I first meet a student the first week of the semester, I give them a piece and say, I want you to learn this how you would learn it. Show me what you can do in about a week. And then they come back and 99.9% .9 of the time, I observe they don't have a plan. And so then I explain to them how I would do it and I want them to give it a try. And that, I'm going to teach you that. If you asked your students that question, or what, do, what happens if you ask a student, here, learn this piece? What are some of the things you observe? I mean, let's pick a piece, a Scarlatti Sonata, right? It's, it's the right piece, it's the right level. The technique is going to be accessible to the student. You're gonna do this for festival, right? What do you see? Just over and over. Yes, that is, that is really, I mean, I, I had a student this semester come back and her eyes were glued to the page like this, and she slopped through this Bach Allemande, and she started from the beginning and played to the end, and it didn't sound like very much. But do you know what, it just actually breaks my heart. I know she practiced more than anybody else. She totally did. She's so earnest. And that's the biggest problem, like trying to help students know, here is the step-by-step -step method, right, of how to do that. What other observations do you have? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe from past negative experiences, maybe from memorizing, or that's the other thing I always love to ask my students is, when do you memorize? What What is the most common answer that I get? After you learn it. Okay. Explain me some more. Right. 
Thanks, Steve. We're getting some nice cello serenade here, but so yeah. I don't know. I don't really. I don't know how I memorize it. It just kind of comes. What does that mean, actually? Well, scientifically, what that means is is that their kinesthetic memory, right? If I throw a ball at you really fast, unexpectedly, and you do this to protect yourself, you did not actually think in real time, oh, no, a ball is coming. Quick, raise my hands, right? Your muscles reacted to the situation. It's a different part of the brain. So they have played something very sloppy with very inconsistent fingerings over and over and over again. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute, I kind of know this. And then they take that ticking time bomb onto the stage to perform <laughs> it in a, in a concert. Right? And, the and the thing that breaks my heart, too, is, is that the, these are some of the most hardworking, earnest kids I've ever seen. And they will go in there, and they will, if I didn't tell her something different, she was going to keep practicing that Bach Alamon four hours a day, and she was, and it was never going to get better. So I'm going to share with you my version about what I tell my students about the how to learn their piece. And one day, Webster Dictionary is going to credit me with the invention of the word NERFI. It's an acronym. But I have used it so much in my career now, and my students are so used to it, it has now become a verb. Are you NERFIing your piece? Yes, I NERFIed that last week. Right. So what I teach my students is I want them to do what's called link practice. And I always draw this chain link slash learning. So I'll walk you through the steps. And I guarantee by the time I'm done, everyone's going to be nodding like, yeah, I, I agree. Because I think we all do something very similar. But if you don't actually sit down and explain this to your student, they're not going to have a, a way to do that. As a matter of fact, the Irene Peary's method was called Fern. But she, did, she didn't like, that was the order that she wanted things to be done, but it didn't spell a nice word, so she put it backwards, Fern. But then you start on the N. And I just felt that that was confusing. I just said, let's do a new word. Yeah? Step one, a student has to determine what their first link is. And what I mean by this is, is how much of the piece you are going to be learning can you bite off and chew? These are very small segments. I hope, maybe, are, are, do we go until 11? Is that what we do? OK. Maybe we'll have time and we can actually pick a piece. You guys can pick a piece and I show you maybe what it would look like. But for me, the size of each link in the learning process is an important step that takes experience, and students will learn it too. You can't do, for example, the entire exposition of a classical sonata as your first link. You're going to see that that's just too much information. You also probably don't want to do half of a beat of a measure is going to be your link. Although, even though that is comical, some of the repertoire kind of requires that, right? I've been learning some scrabbing and some interesting stuff where, yeah, the one part I have to work on is, are these two beats of this measure? That's like all I really can handle, right? And so in the scores, if you look at any hard copy scores that I've learned, you will find all of these interesting tick marks. And they kind of look like this. And one always starts where the other one ended. You know, some of them are shorter, some of them are bigger, but they're all marked in the score visually, so I can see what they are. And as we get going through this acronym, I think it will make more sense. The question is, maybe it's a little gray area, hazy. How much should I be doing on each link? Once you realize what you have to do, then I think it'll make more sense how much you should bite off, right? 
So what's step one? You determined your first link. And let's say for sake of discussion here, it's these two bars, okay? Right here. Once you've determined it, you follow these simple steps. N stands for notes. I want to tell you, no one is trying to make beautiful music yet. This is literally just, what key am I in? What are the accidentals that occur inside of this space? And do I know what these notes are? This can happen instant instantaneously from su for some students and some pianists. It's very simple. You go through, you double check those notes. You're not counting. You're not doing anything except for making sure I know what these notes are. You do this in the right hand alone, and then you do this in the left hand alone. Still no music, still no rhythm. Okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking about having a, does anyone have a score of something that I could do this with? Probably not. You do? It's probably more simple than what you need. No, it's any, anything will work. Do you have a, oh yeah, here, this is great. I'll pick something out of here. Because I know it's groundbreaking, right? I'm just, wait, how do you play notes and not? Who knows the second nocturno by list? Yes? It's got, my first link would be the first bar. Or, yeah, first two bars. It's got triplets and then a held chord. So, key signatures, four sharps. I see some C naturals in there. And I'm just going to double check. D sharp. to see some patterns in the notes, okay? I can hear the harmony of what that is. Left hand. Right, again, another pattern. Right, so I'm starting theoretically to think to myself, fully diminished chord that's kind of spread out a little bit, but again, you don't have to be a theory whiz for this system necessarily to work. I'm just making sure I'm not going to misread anything because misreadings, once you've learned them wrong, you're playing the wrong note, and then two weeks before the recital, you've practiced that for three months, and it's like, how am I, how am I possibly going to change this, right? So I just make sure, okay, that makes sense to me. I can understand what those notes are. I'm seeing some of a pattern. In my left hand, I'm seeing a pattern. Okay. You notice that I didn't go on. I'm not sight reading anything, I'm not trying to make music. R stands for rhythms. Now what I'm going to do is math. I'm going to not try to make music yet, but I'm going to see if I understand how the counting works in this link. This is my chance to get it right without a mistake. How many of your students make rhythmic mistakes? All of them. So this is your chance to be like, okay, here's a triplet. I'm in three, four. This is a dotted half note in the other bar. It holds for the whole three beats. And you get out your pencil, and if, you, if the student needs it, you can write one eanda, two eanda, or one triplet, two triplet. Maybe slightly more advanced students, they get so used to it, they don't need to actually write that in. But you put it in and make sure you understand how it counts. And I can see here that in this measure, really too bad that I don't have this so that you guys can see it. But this measure begins with a rest, which is part of the first triplet. So I'm already realizing, I mean, I think I've taught long enough that I know that every student that tries to learn this is not going to pay attention, that the piece actually begins on a rest, two triplet, two triplet, three triplet, right? So I'm going to write that in there, make sure I understand. Right hand is one triplet. Let two triplet three triplet one triplet two triplet three triplet 
right? As long as it's making sense in my head, I can understand rhythmically what's going on. I try to con play these two now, play the right notes, and count it correctly. You do it with the right hand, and then you do it with the left hand. Again, I made the observation. It starts on the second part of the first triplet beat, right? One triplet, two triplet, three triplet. Many of you, probably the more experienced teachers, which is all of you, are wondering, how do you know what finger to use? Well, F stands for fingerings. And in, initially, there is an aspect of guesswork that happens with the fingerings. You try it. But you can get all the way down to here at a ridiculously slow speed. Never forget it, one of the greatest teaching quotes ever. There is always a speed at which someone can play anything perfectly. You can play Rachmaninoff third piano concerto perfectly. If it's slow enough, you actually can. And you have to take this into how this process goes. No one's trying to go, well, I guess this is quasi lento. So it's supposed to go a little bit slow, but most certainly not that slow, right? This is list. There's going to be some gesture to that. So you're going to go slow enough to make sure that this works. And right here is your opportunity to actually make a concrete decision that you hope doesn't have to change in your right hand and then your left hand. And this one always boggles the minds of my students. And I always get asked the question, you know every single note in your piece, what finger plays that note? Yes, you need to know that. I would not feel comfortable going on stage without knowing exactly what fingers are going to go on which notes, right? And very often we rely on kinesthetic memory of, well, here's how it goes, or I, I don't know, my fingers kind of just move. No, this is your opportunity to be like, I'm going to start this piece, and then it's very helpful to have a performance edition or a good Urtext edition that has uh, fingering suggestions, particularly when you're working with students who have less experience. They're, you know, I often change a lot of the fingerings that I see, but I do think that the editor's suggestions help students move in the right direction. I can see here in this first grouping, the editor has said start with three, and the next time I see a fingering seems to be when I jump and move to a different chord, putting one and two, and then I can see that that pattern repeats exactly the same. Right? So again, I wish you could be seeing it, but I'm saying I am going to make a decision here with my pencil, and I'm going to circle three, and I'm going to circle two. I know I start here, and I'm going to work my way through my hand. One, three, two, four, three, five. Now I've run out of fingers, so I know that that is where my leap is going to be, and I'm going to leap to the F sharp and C natural with one and two, and then repeat that pattern going up. Three, four, five. And then the chord repeats at the top. Does that make sense? So do you have your students write every fingering? Or no. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't expect that every single score that comes to me has every single fingering written down. But you can tell, I mean, there are some places, like for example here, I'm giving myself enough information that I will know what those fingers were. And if you gave me a blank score with no fingerings on it and handed it to me, I could tell you what fingerings I use. I don't have photographic memory. I don't. But I literally could sh look at it and say, you know, spatially understand. Which finger? You guys should know this. What fingering did I say I start this on? Yeah, one and three. How did you know that? You're not even practicing. There is no kinesthetic memory for you, and you already know the fingering of how this piece starts. And then I leap to what? Yeah. So what's happening here is, is that if you do it this way, you are forcing yourself to develop other essential pillars of memory. 
that you need in performance later on. If I just kept playing this over and over again, like you said, students, just from the beginning to the end, you know, you change your fingering every time. How, how are you, I mean, there's just no way. Now I'm just like, I mean, I have hardly, I've been mostly talking, not practicing very much, but I think I really have my first link fingerings really comfortable there. One trip, one trip, one trip, three trip, one. yeah, makes sense. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing in the left hand, right? It's a little bit different. It starts on the trip let of the first beat. One trip. You can hear that it's the same chord, just in a different inversion, following up with the hand. And then I would look at the fingers. Oh, interesting. The editor suggests starting with 2 5. Oh, and I can see it's kind of a similar thing where 2 5, 1 3, 1 2. Do I like that? Is there a better fingering that fits my hand? But I'm, I'm going to keep at that until I feel as confident in the right hand as I do in the left hand. And once I feel like I can play the notes in rhythm, not up to speed, but in rhythm with the correct fingering. Question. Yes. Since we're teaching a lot of Oh, a hundred percent. That's why I do teach technique, as I told you before, because at some point in time, my students have practiced their diminished seventh arpeggios, and so this becomes part of their harmonic language, and they can identify that, and it, then it helps this whole process, whether it be fingering or memory or whatever. If you have a young student who, of course, you hope is exposed to the appropriate level of theory for that student, but you can't really expect them to be a collegiate level whiz at theory comprehension, you know, doing a full scale analysis. But I don't think that you need to be to be able to do what I'm talking about. You can look at these as Jenga shapes or, or those type of Legos or toys that click together. Whenever I play pieces, you, if you guys knew what was going through my mind, I think you would die. It's just, list sonata, there's the knocky knock theme, there's the jumpy jump theme. <laughs> I mean, I had come up with all these silly names and I looked down at the keyboard. I remember learning Prokofiev seventh and I was like finding this, these passages and I was like, oh yeah, so we need blacky black because that's the one that has all the black keys, but the white keys on the outside of the black key. <laughs> Right? That, I, I'm sure that in some theory book someone can tell you what, what was exactly happening there. And I'm sure I could actually solve it. But to be able to play it, I mean, I can call it blacky black. There's whitey white. You know, just figuring out different paths. And sometimes it's just that visual memory of where is your hand supposed to fit. Right? Once you have made a decision in this link about what fingering you're going to use, Oops. You have to ask yourself, question mark, what is the interpretation of this going to be like? So interpretation is not a magic ingredient you throw in at the very end. And sometimes when I present this method, too many people think it's nerf. But it's actually no fee. You're supposed to consider how this will go in context. If you're playing something that's allegro, you need to ask yourself, is this going to work? Right? For example, what if I had chosen as my fingerings for this ascending arpeggio? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. That's what I decided was the best fingering. <laughs> is that a good fingering? No, right? So when I ask myself, how does this piece go? This is romantic music. This is by Liszt. He has the pedal marked here. There's a crescendo. It moves up. I'm going to have to have a little bit of speed moving up there. And I'm pretty quickly going to realize that my one, two, one, two, one, two idea was a bad idea. There has to be a better way to get this 
to go how it goes. I'm going to I'm going to want the voicing to be at the top of these chords. I'm going to want to have more control. So this guy is sort of the quality control of what you're deciding to do with your fingerings, right? You have a passage in a Scarlatti Sonata with a lot of repeating notes, and what you chose was to do thum, 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 and then you realize, oh my goodness, this, this piece goes presto. This is not going to work. I need to come back and reconsider maybe. I need some changing fingerings on the fast notes, etc. I don't expect my students to, especially initially, be interpretation whizzes. I don't expect them to come back and play exactly how it goes. But if they can come back and play their notes correctly, counting them correctly, they've made good fingering decisions that, yes, I, and so do you, always have to fix because there will be things that they thought they had right but needs more attention. And if they have at least a general idea of how the interpretation works, that's really something that you can work with as a teacher, right? But we are not done. There is a step five and a step six. Step five is, is that you must play the link that you have chosen five times in a row, perfect, from memory. I'll bet if I asked Steve to come up here, he could play that opening just from listening to the lecture. I'll bet. The right hand. Look, I'm not going to look at the I don't play this piece. What fingers do I start on? See, how did you know that? Because I mindlessly played my piece in the practice room, and so I guess my, no, you actually know it's 1-3, right? Yeah, I, I, I know that. I haven't even done enough repetitions to begin training my kinesthetic memory, which, by the way, we all need. There's no way we could do this without the kinesthetic memory. But I always describe the kinesthetic memory as the tall, handsome football quarterback in high school. He's so great, and he's got great hair, and he's so nice to be around, and he's dreamy. <laughs> but sometimes when you need him most, <laughs> he's with someone else. <laughs> and so you have to have stabilizers. You have to be able to sit on the stage, and suddenly the nerves are coming, and you feel the shakes, and you're nervous. But all of you can remember, I don't have to like hope I feel what fingering I start with, you know you start with one and three. <laughs> and you also can see what that, how that pattern's gonna unfold. So you have to do one through four, five times in a row perfect from memory. Fast and sloppy with mistakes, no. <laughs> as slow as you need to do it, perfectly, yeah? One trip, two trip, two trip. One triplet, two triplet, tri one. If I start on one, two, fail, start over. You got to do it five times in a row, perfect. And I have I have some students who come for lessons from Wyoming, and they <laughs> they're the sweetest kids. This little girl, she was like, I hate the fifth time because I swear I always mess up on the fifth time. <laughs> But it's forcing you to develop the other areas of memory. And there's all science behind this, right? It's oral memory. It's visual memory. It's most certainly cognitive memory. It's a combination of all of these things. You do that in the right hand five times perfect. You do that in the left hand five times perfect. Sixth step. You do that, I know, I'm a doctor, I can have that kind of handwriting, that's what I tell people. Five times in a row, perfect for memory. Hands together. So, I guess I could do it, practice it in front of you. I, I skipped the left hand part. But eventually, you have to be able to play just that link five times in a row, perfect for memory. 
When you get to this stage, step six, it's very common to have the score in front of you to help stabilize everything because depending on what you're playing, it can be very hard to just suddenly throw your hands together. But if you've done the first five steps correctly, it's possible. You just can't count one of your five times unless it really was from memory. Remind me, I have to tell a story about Frederick Chu, or else I'm going to forget. OK, so let's say in your first link, those first two bars, you followed the steps. You know it starts with finger one and three. You know it starts on the trip uh, let part of beat one, and the left hand starts on this. And you can think about that in your head, even away from the keyboard. You feel comfortable with it, and you follow these steps. Now what do you do? You choose a new link. It's kind of nice in this list piece that the first link, those first two bars, and then the next two bars happen to do something extremely similar. So it's pretty obvious to me that's my second link. I'm going to add two more measures. And so this is my next link. Follow the steps. What are the notes? What are the fi rhythms? What fingerings do I want to use for sure? How does this go interpretation-wise? Let's make sure I can do this five times in a row right hand, five times in a row left hand, and then five times in a row hands together. You made it. Now what do you do? Yeah, good. All the other students always say, another link. No. You add your two links, and you see if it's stuck. Right? You practice connecting from this place to this place, all from memory. Right? And there's not a set number of times that I tell my students that this has to happen. This is more just like your testing ground. Like, did my learning process help me get the information that I need? Right? Usually for me, it's about five times, just making sure, all right, that's stuck. Then what do you do? Yeah, you choose another link, which would probably be two more bars. Or maybe this one has an extra, you know, so maybe it's going to be from here to here. It's going to be link three. You follow it. You link them together. And after a lot of hard work, especially those who are inexperienced with this type of an approach, you feel like you've done not very much. Sometimes, sometimes my practice sessions when I'm learning my pieces, I mean, I got two links done. But I play them well. <laughs> yes? Do you ever do links that are not consecutive? I, I, some, uh, I don't. There are some teaching philosophies. I know some people like to start at the end, different pieces, and then kind of jump around. For me, I have found that starting from the beginning, and following this works best for me, right? But I will tell you this. When this is all done, first of all, what's your name? Mine yes, Yvonne. Yvonne. So that I don't forget to answer that question. We're going to keep doing this, and what are you going to notice is going to happen in the learning process? The chain's going to get very long, and suddenly you want to be learning more measures, but you have to keep going back and playing through that huge chain to make sure it's right. So eventually, you break this chain, and it becomes chain number one. And then you start over at the next measure, and you have another chapter that you're working on here. Link those links together. And you know, as you're looking at music, you can determine, I think, the end of this section, you know, was it? 18 bars, maybe 24 bars. I think this is going to work really well for my first chain. And I'm going to pick up here and move forward, right? And then, of course, what do you do after you finish those next 24 or 36 bars? You link the chains together to make sure that there's continuity in how you're playing that.
Yvonne brings up an interesting point about, would you ever try doing different sections or learning different sections? I don't do it in the learning process, but before I play a recital, I could play my piece for you under tempo, odd measures right hand, even measures left hand. And I could switch it around. Fanny Waterman, I'm not bragging about myself, I'm just saying like, I would be too afraid to play a concert if I didn't know what fingering was going to go in a certain spot, right? Fanny Waterman, who passed away but was the founder of the Leeds International Piano Competition, she had a rule that her students weren't allowed to go compete unless they could start on any measure she chose. How about that? What, what normally happens with a student? Let's find a place where, I, where you can start, where you can start. What does that mean? A lot of those mindless repetitions that you did, let's see if I can get this kinesthetic memory to, to kick in gear. Where's that quarterback? <laughs> right? So maybe that's a little bit over the top, but that's, that's how important I feel like really learning your piece and knowing your piece on a micro level is. Right? Frederick Chu, who's a famous pianist based in uh, Paris, he did this workshop in Italy where we went and did master classes and stuff. And one of the days we were allowed to play for him, but you couldn't practice before. You could just study the score. So new piece. And you have to, basically what he was trying to get you to do is, is can you do Nerfy? Of course, these are more experienced pianists. But could you do it even away from the keyboard? Right? Totally eliminate the kinesthetic reliability, which I don't think is a good idea. I, I, don't, I don't think you should do that. I think it's all part of this system. Yeah. So whenever my students come for their lessons, and we work through their technique, and then we work through the reading, I say, great, hand me your score. Uh, students don't read their piece from their repertoire, because if they learned it, right, or the way I think that they should to have this type of security. And I, and I, I tell them, I don't care how much you learned. I, I, I just know whatever you're going to play for me is going to be accurate. It's like this week I got eight measures. Huh, let's hear your eight measures. And they're going to play it right. I'm going to have to make very few alterations if they've been careful about this, depending on the level of the student. And then I get to teach them what interpretation, Oh, you need more pedal here. You need to use these types of motions to make this technique better or you know, change this fingering or whatever, whatever. And then their next lesson is, is we set a goal, right? When I was in my undergrad and also pre-college when I was at Imperial student, student, the way she did it at the beginning of each semester is, okay, here are your three cost contrasting pieces. Let's make a syllabus. You have to have the first third of this piece learned by this date, the second third by this date, and the, third, the last third by this date. So it was just basically planning how you were going to do Nerfy. Hers was Fern, but like I told you, she changed the letters around, but it's the same idea. And you have to have this much done by that time, and then your second piece, and then your third piece, and then she'd always leave a couple of weeks at the end of the semester that by the time we got there, we had our pieces memorized and were in the practicing mode. Today I'm teaching you, of course, I believe that pianists, maybe, maybe that's not true entirely, but I kind of believe that pianists have two cycles, two stages, right? It's like the caterpillar stage and the butterfly stage, or something like that. I think we're learning pieces and then perfecting pieces. And in my pedagogical view, those are completely different things. The way we learn a piece so that we have it memorized and playable is one thing. Once it's there, how do you practice it so that it's perfect when you need it to be perfect is a totally different thing. And next time I come, I'll, I'll tell you about the full chart, Irene Peary's full chart, which is a different thing. But this is how I tell my students to do it. And sure enough, this girl who was playing the Bach Alamon terribly, couldn't play any right notes with the most bizarre fingering, she came back and she had learned half of it the next week and she played it with great consistency, right? Then we could adjust musical things and fine detail things. And I said, all right, now you've got to get the second half going. Keep nerfing, right? And now she can play it. And now we can work more on pedal depth and sound and et cetera, and she feels more secure. Right? 
You're never going to forget, for some reason, that the second nocturne by Liszt begins with 1-3 in the right hand. <laughs> you won't. And that's the idea. You, you develop those kinds of memories. And of course, by the time you go back and do this chain five times, then the kinesthetic development, of course, is happening. Every time you move, that's going to be happening. So it is all getting in there, but you have so much more than just that sort of mindless reading. Yeah. So I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions. I, <laughs> Kaylee, it's so great to see one of our illustrious graduates. Yeah, I, that's a t that's a co totally different lecture. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't really know what to say. I will say this: I I try my best to gauge what the NERFI assignment is for each student. Sometimes, if I'm dealing with that kind of a student, I try to make it as sm as manageable as possible. Hey, you're coming back if you can play those opening four measures, right? And sometimes when I'm getting on my students' cases who are not really following this carefully, in the lesson, I'm like, let me show you something. Do this. And seven minutes later, because I forced them to do Nerfi, they're playing it. Right? So it does work. And, and then you have, other, you have other students who, you see this once in a while, that they learn and memorize very quickly because it's extremely intuitive. They're remarkably talented. And so it's like, this just kind of makes sense. Like, this is how it goes, you know? And you don't want to hold that student back, but I still feel like, even though it comes very intuitively to them, it should be a step-by-step -step process to cover all of your bases, right? Yeah, here and here and here. Yeah. Yeah. For for me, for me, five. I just feel like it's that it's a magic number with an, enough repetitions that are correct that way. I feel like there's some stability there, because you know you're going to come back to your piece the next day and it's going to feel shaky. That's just kind of the way memory develops, and so you're going to have to do some patchwork and stuff. So. I just try to have more more repetitions than less repetitions, you know. But I still I still think even with the youngest student, if you're teaching them by rote, it's still this way, right? You just you're teaching them the notes yourself by showing them where the notes go, and you're teaching them the rhythm because maybe you're demonstrating how it goes. But I think that this transcends age limits. It's not just college students. I think young kids need to have some kind of a plan about how they put things together. Yeah. There was a question here and then Pam. Hi there, just a comment. Uh, last week I was working with an upper intermediate student. Our link was two measures, pretty tricky. Had her notes, had the rhythm. If I was counting, none of my students like to count. You need to count if you have a comment on that. Correct fingering and everything. But the rhythm, and she could play it a number of times correctly, but the rhythm didn't Okay, let's just do some muscles. So we did the rhythm on our laps yeah. with the large muscles, and all of a sudden, it's stuck. Is that? Yeah, you find any way, you know, Steve Thomas and I were talking recently about how to help seemingly impossible uh, rhythmic problems help students figure out how to do that. And yes, I think marching around the room, I think using rhythms in your hands to figure out how it works, all of that is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> 
it's, I don't. <laughs> that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I'm stumped because I tell them you have to do it this way. And so counting is part of it. If you're not, if you're not counting, how can, you even fit, how, can, how can you even do one link? You can't skip two. Two is there. Yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good thing. Well, and I think, I think maybe I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling a little stumped by that question because I've had two teachers my whole life, and I wouldn't if they told me you need to count like this and learn. I just, I, I didn't want to die. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't want to die. <laughs> Yeah, so. She said, I could never sing in high school when I was young. And I heard that there's te uh, teachers that, that demand that their you know, students sing. Do you do that? Yeah, of course. I always tease that we know that the piano is the one instrument we're always trying to make sound not like a piano. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Everything we're doing at the piano is evocative of something, right? I mean, some, I guess there is some real piano sounds, but generally speaking, we're trying to imitate an orchestra with Beethoven or bel canto opera with Chopin or something. And so singing becomes natural. It's like you have to be able to do that so that you can imitate these other sounds. Who was it? Uh, Pam said it once in my pedagogy class. There was some pedagogue who was saying, it's just not fair because we're, we're supposed to imitate the human voice. And what we have is, is 88 hammers that we are throwing at strings, you know, <laughs> at different speeds, and our teacher is trying to say, sing like a human, you know? It's a kind of a complicated task, yeah? Pam, you had a... Yes, I adjust their assignment based on their level. Very, very often I have to break this down. Can you imagine? I have a little six-year-old right now who's starting a little Mozart minuet or something. Of course, this week I want these four measures no feet, but right hand alone and left hand alone, right? So you have to, you have to be uh, adaptable with your curriculum to make sure. You know. And then you had a qu question? Yeah, uh, with their method books, so you wouldn't do this with techniques. You wouldn't do this with simple things in their lesson, but only with performance pieces, or do you do nursery pieces? No. Like no, it's not a stupid question at all. In, in technique, I expect it to be from memory. Right? So I suppose that there are some elements to this. But technique usually is a pattern that repeats. And so it's not like there's such a significant memory game going on there. So it doesn't need to be from memory. Their reading books, like, you know, Faber Level 1 or whatever, if they are in Faber, Faber Level 1, I expect that I'm assigning them pieces that is about where they can read like this, like they are learning the nomenclature, et cetera. So that's, that's a different exercise. This is training students. Try playing this piece. Watch these notes, right? That's why I started my lecture by saying, you know, this is not ironclad, you know, Suzuki, you're not allowed to read notes sort of a thing, right? I mean, not that the Suzuki philosophy teaches that, but I have a component that is like you must develop into a good reader, and so here are your reading exercises. But I would never use this on a reading exercise. You're, you would be missing the, the point and growth of sight reading, okay. becoming a better sight reader. And that's also another lecture, <laughs> how to teach sight reading. Any other questions? So I have yet to find a student who has come back after I've drilled this into them 
who says, I know a better way. I don't want to do your way. Well, actually, I've had some students who say, I don't want to do it, but it's always bad. <laughs> so I'm open. If a student comes to me and says, no, you're your perfectly fine-tooth combed method of making sure I know my pieces really well. I just don't like it. I have a better way. It still hasn't happened yet. So. Any other questions? I know we went over a little bit. Yeah. <laughs>